Hello, my name is Roy Simpson. I'm a professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This is a, an, a lecture for intermediate algebra. Uh, the focus of this lecture is going to be functions, so it's going to be a longer lecture. We have several things to talk about here. In this part, we're going to talk about just what is a function, all the parts of a function, um, the basics of functions. Turns out functions are going to be uh, the major focus for the rest of any intermediate algebra course that you're involved in. So from this point forward, uh, this is what you want to focus in on. And in fact, I just added a couple more topics on there. So this uh, list can get longer and longer, but I think that this pretty much will sum up all topics within functions. But like I said, from this point forward, every type of lecture that you will have in an intermediate algebra course will involve the word function. Now, any good conversation about functions really has to start with an idea of a relation first. Because a relation is what we're kind of used to in mathematics up to this point. All a relation is is a rule relating two or more variables to one another. And there are a lot of relations. In fact, almost everything we've done in mathematics is based on relations. For example, the volume of a cylinder is a relation. It's a relationship between R, H, and V, where R is the radius, H is the height, V is a volume. It just relates these two, these three variables. And uh, obviously there's, you know, area of a square or, or a rectangle. A equals LW. That's just a relation between LW and A. Um, y equals 2X minus 1. That's a relation between the variables x and y. One more kind of relation would be something like x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. It's not a relation that you've dealt with yet, but this is just a relationship between x and y, right? If you let x be something, y is something else. But this is an example that I think we should focus in on anyway. So let's take a look at this. If x were 1, let's pretend, y would be, well, if x were 1, we'd have 1 squared plus some number is equal to 1. That some number would have to be 0. But if x were negative 1, y would also have to be 0. In other words, if I were to build a table of values here, and I let x equal 1, I'd force y to be 0. If I let x equal negative 1, I'd force y to be 0. If I let x equal 0, it forces y to be 1 or to be negative 1. And here's where the rub is, right here. If I plug in the number 0 for x and I have a couple different options for y, so two options, then this is sort of an issue in mathematics. We don't like to have options. We like to say, hey, I plug in 0, I get out 1. Not, I plug in 0, I get out 1 or negative 1. So this, this is the issue with relations that are not functions. However, a function is the next step up in the, I guess, evolutionary chain in mathematics. It's what most of us in mathematics want to have. It's just a rule or a relation where each input, which is normally initially when you're working with functions, your x variable, each of those x variables leads to a single output, which we normally, again, when you're first starting to work with functions, you call that the y variable. But after a while, we stop working with x's and y's, we can work with any letter we want. The idea is, if you have some machine, some function where you plug something into it, you only want one thing coming out. In fact, that's a great idea. Let's go ahead and draw this as a machine. What, what we're about to draw here is what's known as the machine diagram for a function. And essentially, you have some type of machine. And by the way, I did not make up this picture for a machine. It's just that this is the standard picture for a mathematical machine. Anyway, you have some type of input that you plug into this machine. 
And if you can imagine, this is a box that you cannot see into, that machine does something to that input and out pops some type of output. But the idea here is that it's a single output, not two outputs. Now so far I haven't really mentioned anything about equations or graphs or tables or anything like that because I want to keep this discussion very very general but I still need to introduce a little bit of some definitions here. The input we normally call the independent variable. It's what we get to kind of play with. It's what we get to choose to plug in. And what pops out completely depends upon that and so we call that the dependent variable. So I suppose that we could rewrite our definition of a function, although it's not really necessary, but it's some people like to see uh, a proper definition for a function. Uh, so we could rewrite as a relationship between two variables where each choice for the independent variable leads to a single possibility for the dependent variable. Again, it's just a machine. You plug something in and you get one thing out. Now I put a little asterisk right there under 2 or above 2 because in the future you can have functions that have more than two variables. You can have 10 variables. Uh, so the, if you ever read that a function is a relationship between two variables, that's sort of a lie. It's, it could be between many variables. Well, let's try to get an idea of what a function really truly is here by just taking a list, a pool of names, and I'm not taking every name in the world, I'm just taking names of people. Let's say these are specific people in your class or that you know. So let's say you know a guy named John A and you happen to know a girl named Jessica um, C and Navpreet A and Keisha R. Okay, so th there are four people that we're going to be talking about. And let's pretend we have a list of shoe sizes over here, 11 and 9 and 3, 5, 8, 2, um, and uh, 14. Okay, notice that this is just a pool of objects over here and a pool of objects over on the name pile. Now, this can be a function. If we had some machine that we could pop a person's name into and it leads over to their shoe size, then this could be construed as a function. And let's just have an app pre come over here. There we go. And Keisha, I don't know if there's actually a size three shoe. I have no, I have no clue. I don't buy shoes that often. So but let's just pretend that this is how it works out. Notice that in this case, um, each person's name leads to a single output. This is a function. You give John's name, out pops the number nine because that's his shoe size and so on and so forth. Now let's see what happens when we adjust this slightly. Let's suppose that Jessica also wears a size 8. Does this make it not a function? Well let's see. John A, when you plug his name into the machine, it pops out the size 9. When you plug Jessica C's name into the machine, it pops out 8. So she has, you plug her name in, it responds with one value. Navpreet, you plug her name in, it also responds with size 8. But you plugged her name in and got one value out. And Keisha, you plug her name in and you get the size 3. So again, this is still a function. This is actually a function still because each person doesn't have two possibilities for shoe sizes. They just have one. Now here's where it's not a function. Let's take... Um, Actually, I'm not going to have to erase. Let's just pretend that Keisha has two weird feet. One is size 3 and one is size 2. Now, again, I plug in John's name. It leads to 9. I plug in Jessica's... It says Jessica. I just, I just realized that. Sometimes I write fast. I don't pay attention to what I'm doing. 
Jessica's name you plug in it leads to size 8. Now if Preet's name you plug in, it leads to size 8. But Keisha, you plug in her name, and it could lead to either 3 or 2. Once you say that, that either 3 or 2, then you know this is not a function. And that's the indicator, is that if you have an input that you would normally plug in and it leads to two possibilities, you know it's not a function. This is where the world kind of starts falling apart mathematically because we, we want to plug one thing in and get one thing out. Here's another example of a function. If you input the US state, some state's name, and the output is a, the state bird, each U.S. state has a single state bird. Some of them might overlap. I don't think they do. But some of them might overlap. But the fact is, each state only has one U.S. or one state bird. So this is a function. However, I just looked it up, and the opposite is not true. So if you consider the input to be the state bird... and the output to be the US state, you will find that that is not a function. The reason why is because, for example, if you plug in the bird cardinal, you will get out, and I haven't looked through all of them, but I've, I, do, I saw two of them at least, that will lead to Illinois and Indiana. And like I said, I didn't look through all of them, so it might even lead to more. So this, the way it's written, if we write it this way, is not a function. Very interesting example, actually. So um, good to, to know that sometimes you can have a function that works one way, but if you switch the roles of the inputs and outputs, then it turns out that the opposite is not true. It's not a function the other way. Last couple definitions prior to ending this part of this lecture. There are two major object or topics in um, functions, or when we talk about functions, and that's domain and range. These are super important, and, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of textbooks and authors tend to not focus on these very much. But I think that this tends to be one of the more important topics, especially for later on in mathematics. The domain is considered to be the set of all allowable inputs for a function. It's basically a collection of everything that you can plug in to that function. In our previous example, where we talked about these state birds, if we forget about the second example here, so let me just erase that out, and we just think about this first example, I'm having a hard time erasing fast, um, the set of inputs is the U.S. states. So, our domain would be the set of state names. The range, on the other hand, that's the set of all outputs for the given domain. It's not really that tricky. It's just the fact that um, if I know my domain, well, based on that, I can create a collection of outputs. If you think about this previous example, the domain, remember, was just the set of US states. The outputs is not all. It's not the set of all bir birds. That's not the range. The range is actually the set of the birds that are state birds. So it's not every single bird in the world. It's just a small collection of birds, and not even 50 of them actually, because some states share a state bird. So fewer than 50 birds uh, would be our range for this function. All right, so in the next video lecture, we'll talk about the four ways that functions can be represented, and then one of those we'll go into more detail in future lectures. But we've sort of touched upon some of the ways already by writing some equations down and also writing out some word problems. But you'll see in the next video lecture that there are some very unique ways that you can represent a function.